Good afternoon and welcome to Africa.com's Crisis Management for African Business Leaders. My name is Soku Sibia from Africa.com. All of our webinars are available for replay on virtual conference Africa.com. The conversation continues on Twitter. Remember to tag Africa underscore com and use hashtag virtual conference Africa. Thank you so much, Soku. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Standard Bank, our main sponsor, for their steadfast support of this webinar series. And we, they are also going to be the sponsor of some future work that we're very excited to bring to the Africa.com webinar series. And we will tell you a little bit more about that later. But thank you very much. We'd also like to thank the Harvard Business School and Harvard Law School faculty who have worked with us very closely in order to develop this series of webinars. Um, we could not do this without you, and we thank you for your appreciation. We have a new name to this list, which is Professor Carolyn Elkins, and we'll mention her a little bit later in terms of work that we will be doing with her going forward. We're going to start with a slightly different format. Today, our, our moderator is both an expert and a moderator, and so she will begin with a presentation on her own. We are going to start with um, Jillian Pace, who is a partner in McKinsey's Kenya office. She leads all of the firm's work in agriculture in Africa. She serves agricultural companies and organizations across Africa and emerging markets on topics such as business strategy, digital for agriculture, market entry, mergers and acquisitions, supply chain, farm operations, and procurement. She also serves governments and development partners on agricultural development and investment strategies. In Africa, Jillian's led work covering 18 countries. She's also published on winning strategies for private companies in Africa's agricultural market and the impact of COVID-19 on Africa's agriculture and food systems. And so today she will be leading us through a presentation on her report by the same name, name, by the same name as today's session, which is Safeguarding Africa's Food Systems Beyond and Through the Crisis. She is the expert on that topic. But we also have some additional experts to help unpack this in a panel after Jillian completes her presentation. That panel includes Linda Monda. Linda is a global head of global, of global agribusiness for corporate investment banking at Standard Bank Group. Linda is a finance executive with over 20 years experience. She specialized in the development and agriculture space, working with international NGOs, the Malawi government and industry. She notably contributed to smallholder farmer financing models in Africa that bridge the gap between smallholder farmers and finance sector. Her work in the development area has ranged from food security to HIV and AIDS. Before joining Standard Bank, she managed the Africa treasury function of a multinational agricultural company. We then have Kola Masha. Kola is the managing director of Babangona. Babangona is an award-winning, high-impact, financially sustainable, and highly scalable social enterprise, part owned by the farmers that they serve. Babangona was created to specifically attract youth to agriculture and away from the looming instability of extremist groups. Kola brings significant leadership experience in venture capital, corporate finance, business development, marketing, and operations across four continents with multiple global companies, including GE, Notori, and Aviomed. In addition, Kola brings extensive public sector experience as a senior advisor to the Nigerian Minister of Agriculture. Kola brings extensive, um, excuse me, he's been recognized for his leadership in driving positive change on the African continent as he's received several global awards, including the prestigious Eisenhower Fellowship, a leading leadership institute led by General Colin Powell and appointed to the board of the African Enterprise Challenge Fund. Thank you very much for bringing your agricultural sector expertise to us, Kola. Then we have Mezu and Wiley. Mezu is the managing partner of Sahel Capital Agribusiness Managers, which is a food and agriculture focused private equity firm which invests in mid sized agribusinesses in Nigeria. He is also the chairman and co founder of AACE Foods, a food processing company which produces spices, seasonings, and packaged food. He's worked for 25 years in corporate finance, investment banking, and private equity. But since for the last decade, he has focused exclusively on the agricultural sector in Africa. Thank you very much, Mizu, for joining us. And then the last panelist I'd like to introduce is Atsuko Toda. Atsuko is the Director of the Agricultural Finance and Rural, Inf Rural Infrastructural Development Department at the African Development Bank. Since 2016, she's been serving in this role as Director. 
in Africa. The department is responsible for the bank's investments in private sector agribusiness companies and the development of special agro-industrial processing zones across the African continent. Currently, there's much interest from African governments to build their agro-industrial sectors and promote private sector development. Atsuko joined the African Development Bank from the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD, where she's worked for close to 20 years on rural development and financing in Asia and Africa. Having held several positions in different countries of Asia, she moved to Africa as the country director for Nigeria in 2012. So she has eight years of experience on the ground, managing a portfolio of investments in rural development and accelerating access of, of farmers to, to, to new technologies, finance and markets. So we couldn't ask for a greater set of experts to help us look at the question of food security in Africa coming out of the crisis that we have now and beyond. So with that, I will turn it over to Jillian, who will lead us through her presentation on today's main topic. Thank you very much, Teresa. And it's uh, my pleasure to kick off our discussion today. Um, I'd love to talk to you um, before we start our panel on what is the nature of food security in the face of COVID-19 in Africa? And of course, uh, when the COVID crisis first hit the continent, the first question almost all of us on this panel got, I'm sure, um, from our colleagues as well as from many government leaders is, after health, will we have enough food? Uh, food in this continent, uh, which has a very high food import dependency ratio, is of critical um, importance. Most countries in Sub-Saharan Africa have a food import dependency ratio in the range of 10 to 35 percent. And when you talk about North Africa, that goes up to 35 to 60 percent. The worry has always been, uh, will we have enough food? Indeed. So I'm going to talk about the African context, but before I do that, let me talk about what's happening globally in agriculture and food in the face of COVID-19. Uh, now, if you think back to 2008, uh, when we did have a food crisis, and you look at 2020, 12 years later, let's understand that there are some differences now. Actually, in the past 12 years, uh, one good thing is that the world has actually built up more food stocks than we had in 2008. We have about 16% more food inventories than we did in 2008 today. Um, China has nearly 74% more food, food stocks than it had in 2008, but many other countries have also built up their food stocks. So we actually have pretty good inventories of cereals around the world. Um, you also think about trade. Uh, now many of you who knew, read the newspaper will have heard about export bans, export quotas, varying things like that in the news over the past few months. Um, but if we dig a little bit deeper into that, we also see that while these have been put in place, sometimes they're temporary, and sometimes they're actually uh, not as bad as you might think. Let me give an example of Ukraine. Ukraine is a major wheat exporter, um, also a major sort of wheat source of wheat for much of Africa. Uh, it put in an export quota, but it had a record wheat harvest. So actually, it has exported more this year than it did last year. And Vietnam, which is a major rice exporter to Africa, did put in an export ban, but actually that is no longer active. So we are seeing these kind of situations happen in terms of our trade, but the message is that inventories are good. And while we are facing some disruptions, uh, including on the logistics side, which we'll talk about later, by and large, food is flowing. So let's talk about Africa. I'd love to actually put up a presentation uh, now to talk about that. So, in Africa right now, we are standing at 250,000 COVID-19 cases. So I'm happy to share with you here some of the findings of what has actually happened over those past few weeks uh, here in Africa in terms of agriculture and food security. So let's go to the next slide. Let me give you a little bit of context on the agriculture system in Africa uh, with a few brief facts. So Africa exports actually 35 to $40 billion worth of agriculture products every year. Uh, these are largely cash crops, such as cocoa, coffee, and tea. But Africa imports 45 to $50 billion worth of agriculture products, largely staples such as wheat and sugar and palm oil. We also import about $6 billion of agricultural inputs, that's fertilizer, seed, and crop protection chemicals. We do have quite a bit of regional trade of agriculture products in Africa, about $8 billion 
of food flows through regional trade, largely interregional trade versus interregional trade, um, but still quite substantial. And agriculture is a huge source of employment on the continent. Uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it is said to employ about 60% of the workforce and contribute about 23% to GDP. So just so you understand how significant um, this uh, sector is to the continent as a whole. So with that in mind, let's go to the next slide. Coming into this crisis, Africa's agriculture systems had some headwinds and some tailwinds. So let's talk about the headwinds. In 2017 and 2018, we had significant, significant droughts in large parts of Africa. Uh, but last year, we actually had great rainfall in some parts of Africa, and particularly East Africa, Southern Africa, and West Africa. So many of these countries that, you know, if this crisis had hit even two years ago, would have been in quite a dire situation, actually came into this crisis with significant food stocks. Kenya is reporting a record maize harvest. South Africa is reporting the highest maize harvest they expect to have had in five years at this point. We also should be aware that the lockdowns that did happen in Africa largely happened after the major planting seasons in East and West Africa, which tend to happen around March and April. Um, that meant that agricultural inputs had largely been distributed and purchased and planting had begun in many countries before uh, the lockdowns actually hit. And to date, uh, when we talk to agriculture value chain players, as well as governments, we're very much aware that agriculture and food distribution is considered largely an essential service and has been allowed to progress um, for the most part across the continent. Um, sorry, those were the tailwinds. Now let's talk about the headwinds, actually. Um, so while there are some countries and regions that did emerge better into this crisis, let's also remember that there are some that are still under conflict and still reeling from uh, climatic events uh, we think about the Sahel, we think about Zimbabwe, we think about northern Mozambique, uh, which have actually are still under stressed conditions. And many cash crops, which, as I mentioned earlier, are major sources of our exports, actually came into this crisis at relatively low pricing, if you look historically. Um, I'm talking about cocoa and coffee pricing in particular. And while there was some indication that those were rising in early 2020, they were on average at quite a low when you look at the past few years, which of course affects many farmers' incomes. And lastly, uh, there's of course the ongoing discussion around the locust infestation in East Africa, uh, which is an ongoing risk to food production in that region. So those are some of the tailwinds and headwinds that face the continent coming into this crisis. Let's go to the next slide to actually talk then about what the shocks could be. So we see three shocks that could be posed by COVID-19. And we will engage, of course, more, more with our panel on these shocks, but to just to give you an overview of what they are. Um, so the first is a demand side shock, uh, which is due to the loss of jobs and livelihoods and food price volatility um, that could actually amplify food insecurity. The second is a trade shock, largely on the export side, which I'll talk more about. And the third one is a possible production shock, which may come in the second planting seasons later in this year. So let me talk through each of these. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so over half of Africa's population is considered to be at least moderately food insecure. You see this chart on the left here, which says that 650 million people in Africa are called considered at least moderately food insecure. Uh, with about 275 million severely food insecure. This is data from the Food and Agriculture Organization, um, and this is 2008. So coming into this crisis, this was already the situation. Um, if any of you have read some of McKinsey's work on the impact of COVID-19 in Africa, you will also have read that we are projecting a loss in jobs of 100 to 150 million people on the continent. Uh, so there is going to be a major reduction in incomes and actually is already a major reduction in incomes for many people across the continent. And let's keep in mind that uh, many of the poorest of the poor in Africa will spend up to 80% of their income on food. Um, and you'll see the ranges depending on the type of category here on the, on the right. Uh, 
And so with that income reduction comes reduced ability to afford food. Let's go to the next slide, please. And we see that already in some emerging evidence. Uh, we run a survey every couple of weeks on the, uh, what people are feeling in terms of their income and what their ability to live off their savings is. And you'll see here the results from early May of a survey we ran in Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa of about 2,100 people. Um, and you'll see 80% of them are actually very concerned about their job security. And 25 to 35% of them have less than one month of savings to live off of. So let's go to the next slide. Um, sorry, actually, before I conclude that, that, uh, that section, let me mention that there are some surveys and studies starting to come out to, that are validating that this is having an impact on food expenditure. Um, in Uganda, there was a study done very recently on 1,000 households that found that adults are cutting back about 40% of their food expenditure at this point due to those reduced livelihoods. So we think about that food security shock, that demand side shock, people actually reducing their consumption and expenditure on food due to reduced incomes. Now let's talk about the trade shock. Um, so Africa's agriculture exports, you'll see a chart here that breaks that down. Um, about 80% of our exports go to regions that were severely impacted by COVID-19 in the first and second quarter of this year, um, largely to Western Europe, Southeast East Asia, and then Middle East and North America. Um, for many countries, Kenya, Uganda, Ghana, agriculture exports are the one or the first or the second source of foreign exchange and export earnings for those countries. Uh, so keeping that export going is very critical. However, as you can imagine, uh, when the lockdowns hit, there were two effects. Uh, one is we saw a demand side effect uh, with many people uh, in the receiving regions actually um, but due to their lockdowns and people staying home consuming less. Uh, you imagine that Africa is a huge exporter of coffee, for example, and people were not getting their uh, daily Starbucks anymore. Um, and so while that would be switched with home consumption, uh, there was some depression in demand. Um, and then there was also a supply side shock. Uh, you know, significant amounts of this fruits and vegetables that you'll see here are actually exported via air cargo. And when the international passenger flights actually largely closed, uh, that significantly reduced the amount of cargo that was actually available um, for many regions. In Kenya, this was a 75% reduction overnight, which has since recovered quite a bit, uh, but let's just remember for several weeks, there was quite a shock. So if we go to the next slide, um, you'll see here some snippets from the news around what that impact is um, across these major, uh, major export areas. And flowers is a great example. Um, Africa exports about a, million, a billion dollars worth of flowers, largely to Europe. Um, and was hugely impacted by this freight issue. Um, and in fact, uh, the flower industry in Kenya temporarily collapsed. Uh, and although it's recovering now, uh, is still in quite a challenging situation. Overall, our estimation is that COVID-19 could impact about four to $5 billion of exports from Africa to the rest of the world, which would impact over 10 million farmers' lives. So let me then talk about the last shock here, which is on the next slide, and which is uh, a production shock. So while I mentioned that the lockdowns happened uh, largely right after the major planting season in some regions, there is usually a second season uh, in East and West Africa that happens in the second half of the year. Um, and actually the major planting season in Southern Africa is in the second half of the year. And so we still need to keep our eye on what will happen um, for those planting seasons. And there are some challenges that we are already picking up on. So one is a significant drop in remittances. Uh, the World Bank really recently came out with an analysis saying they're expecting a nearly 25% drop in remittances to Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we should recall that many people rely on remittances as a income source, um, which contributes to their ability to purchase inputs. Uh, such as fertilizer and seed for the upcoming planting season. Uh, so this is, a, is an issue to be monitored in terms of the impact it will have in the second half of the year. Of course, we are seeing currency devaluations, which make inputs more uh, expensive. 
Uh, and while largely trade is flowing in Africa, there are ongoing bottlenecks. We are seeing um, delays at borders, temporary border closures sometimes, uh, and this could be in particular a challenging situation for inland countries which really rely on things like their agriculture inputs to pass through at least one if not more countries to come to them uh, for the next planting season. And then uh, we have potential restrictions on labor movements and again uh, as COVID-19 cases increase this may become more and more stringent, uh, we don't know, uh, but many countries already domestically are restricting the flow of people across their countries to mitigate the spread. Uh, and then again, many farmers also rely on uh, day labor for planting and harvesting. So this is a key, key area to watch. And finally, pest outbreaks. I mentioned the locust outbreak, uh, but there's also, of course, fall armyworm, uh, which is another pest in East Africa that needs to be monitored and could have an impact on our overall food production for this year. So I just wanted to give you an overall context uh, around where we are standing in terms of agriculture and food security in Africa at this point. Uh, we'll talk to our panel much more about what kind of actions uh, companies, investors, and governments can take in response uh, to, to this situation. Uh, but before we go there, um, I think we would like to take some questions or perhaps do a poll. Is that correct, uh, Teresa? Yes, thank you very much, Jillian. We have a question coming out of South Africa, and I'll read the question for this person. Um, why is over half the popular food, why is, why is over half of the population food insecure? How does that compare to other developing regions? Great question. So food insecurity in the sense of moderate food insecurity, as the Food and Agriculture Organization defines it, it's people who uh, struggle to guarantee that they can actually consume uh, let's say a set of square meals every single day and may actually have to skip a meal at least once a month. Um, and so if you think about where 60% of the population in Africa is employed, they are largely smallholder farmers, um, therefore relying on very seasonal income um, and therefore uh, often entering what we call a hunger season, which is the time before the harvest where there is constrained affordability for food. Um, so as a result, uh, they end up being classified as moderately food insecure. Um, severely food insecure people, which is that 275 million uh, number, are people who are much more food stressed and tend to be in either very arid areas, conflict zones, um, and situations such as that, and therefore are really in what we would consider more of a risk of perpetual starvation or severe hunger. Uh, so just so you understand what the definition is and why over half is classified as moderately food insecure. Um, Africa does have the largest percentage of it globally, the food insecure population. Unfortunately, I don't remember off the top of my head what percentage that is. And Atsuko, when we get to her, maybe can answer that question. Um, but we do have the largest percentage of the food insecure population on the continent globally. We have another question coming out of Kenya. And this question is, um, you've spoken a bit about how the current situation is impacting food security. How does the current situation likely to impact food insecurity in the longer term? Are there things that are happening now that will not be resolved in the short term? It's a great question and one I would actually love to discuss in the panel. Uh, I think if I think about it right now for the past few months, uh, many governments and food companies and agriculture companies have been focused on crisis response, which has been making sure things are flowing fundamentally and things are being produced. Uh, now we are at an inflection point where the discussion is pivoting towards what is the long term look like for food security um, and is this shock an opportunity to really rethink what we consider resilience, uh, which is what we mean by actually being resilient to these kinds of shocks. So I don't have the answer um, and actually I really look forward to a great discussion with our panel panel on that one. So forgive me for punting, uh, punting that question to the panel when we get there. Okay, we'll give you a couple more questions and then we'll move on. Um, Sarah Kawisa asks, how is it that we experience food insecurity yet exports are high on fruits, vegetables, and nuts? So uh, the, the types of fruits, vegetables, and nuts we're producing um, for export, uh, if you break it down a little bit further, we're talking about things like green beans out of Kenya, a lot of citrus out of South Africa, a lot of citrus out of Morocco, 
um, high-end nuts such as macadamia out of East Africa, cashews, et cetera. Um, and we talk about food insecurity largely as looking at what the base load of what people are consuming, which is staples, largely cereals. Uh, and if you actually look at the average consumption profile of a household in, in Africa, I, the data I have on this is a slightly old, uh, but about 60% of what people are consuming, if not more, is uh, a cereal, which would be maize, it would be rice, it would be some wheat-based product. Uh, and this is where the food insecurity question becomes, right? Because often people are growing uh, that food if they can. Maize is a commonly grown crop, rice is commonly grown as well, but sometimes they also rely on purchasing that food, which is, for example, wheat, which is a crop that does not grow very well in much of Africa and is largely imported. Uh, so if you think about people actually needing to be able to purchase uh, some of those staples and actually also needing to be able to purchase additional consumption because they might not grow enough for themselves and largely do not grow enough for themselves. Uh, then they'll need cash to make those purchases. And that's where we see this food insecurity issue uh, because you'll have farmers or largely small farmers about a hectare of land, maybe an acre of land, largely keeping that consumption for them, their families and needing to sell some of it in order to buy food and potentially not being able to get enough cash off that production to ensure a steady supply of food for themselves and their families. Okay. We'll give you one last question coming out of South Africa. Sepo Maiko asks, isn't the food security and log logistics disruption for markets abroad an opportunity for intra-regional trade? South African farmers are currently plowing back lettuce into the ground, and yet Mauritius is paying ridiculous prices for the same commodity because their current supply is usually from India. This is an excellent question, and I would 100% agree that this is a great opportunity to strengthen our regional trade. Uh, I mentioned that $8 billion number of regional trade that does happen uh, in, in Africa for food and agriculture products. A lot of that trade happens within regions. So you'll have East African countries trading amongst themselves, Southern African countries trading within themselves, largely over land borders. There's very little trading across regions or overseas uh, in, in Africa uh, in terms of food and agriculture when you look at the data. Uh, so indeed, a lot of the, uh, those types of things are imported internationally. And it is a great question and something Again, a great topic for our panel to actually talk about how we can strengthen our regional trade uh, in the face of this type of situation. Very good. Well, thank you for taking those questions, Jillian. And so we are now going to go to our poll. And so I will turn this over to Soku Subia of Africa.com to lead us through the audience poll. Soku, over to you. Thank you, Teresa. So we've got three polls today. The first being the question is. I'm concerned that Africans will have difficulty accessing sufficient food in the next six months. Do you strongly agree with this statement? Agree with it? Neither agree nor disagree? Disagree or strongly disagree? We're just waiting for the poll to come through. Okay, the numbers are done, so let's close the poll. We are at 42% agree with this statement. So let's move to the next statement. To what do you agree with this following statement? I am concerned about the price of basic food in Africa in the next six months. Do you strongly agree? Agree. Neither agree nor disagree. Disagree or strongly disagree. It's actually quite concerning that, you know, in the next six months you are concerned. Yeah. yeah. So we have, um, I think we're going to close this poll off. The, the votes came in quickly and it looks like we have 92% that agree or strongly agree. And the last question is, do you think that the African Union should make reduction in the importation of food products a priority in order to increase self-reliance? Yes or no? Very simple question. Do you think that the African Union should make reduction in the importation of food products a priority? in order to increase self-reliance. I think we can stop the poll. Uh, it's clear that 80% say yes, 20% say no. I'll leave it up to the panel to discuss the results. Thank you. Thank you, Soku, for leading us so ably through that poll. And now we're going to bring back Jillian Pace, and she is now going to moderate this wonderful panel of experts to continue the conversation on 
Africa's food security through and beyond the crisis. Jillian, I hand it back over to you. Great, thank you, Teresa. So I'm incredibly excited to have this discussion now with our excellent panelists. Um, and thank you as well, all of you, for responding to that poll. I think the last question in particular is a great tee up um, to our first panelist, Atsuko, uh, who works at the African Development Bank. Um, Atsuko, uh, of course, we were briefly talking about this even before this webinar uh, around this question around whether African countries should actually be more self reliant or self sufficient in terms of their food production and food consumption. Uh, so my question to you is, is that the right way to look at it? And what investments do you think governments or other actors should make now to improve their food systems resilience in Africa? Okay, thanks a lot, Jillian, and excellent presentation. I'd, um, before I start the presentation, I'd just like to say coming into COVID-19, Africa's food systems were going through a very dynamic transition. So food supply chains were consolidating. Uh, they were stretching out, reaching into rural areas, and there was a proliferation of small, medium enterprises. Um, please put up the slides. Um, yes, uh, second slide. And actually, Julian has actually covered all the different impacts, but due to COVID-19, Africa has experienced its deepest recession in 25 years. So what we're looking at right now on the ground is the slowdown of the informal economy. And what does that translate into is a fall in purchasing power. So when we talk about food insecurity, it is about the power to purchase. And low income households are cutting back on food consumption, particularly nutritious foods. The World Food Program has already projected that there could be the number of hungry people could increase or double in 2020. So the real challenge now for African governments is to build back that demand. Africa's food systems need to build back the purchasing power, increase incomes and create jobs. Next slide, please. While acknowledging the rapid response facilities, the emergency operations that African governments have been taking, as well as development partners, I'd like to talk about the post-COVID food system. And in that context, it's so important that we build back on the positive trends of the last decade and also build forward on some of the trends, including the fact that 40% of Africa's population lives in urban areas and is projected to increase to 60%. And that has a massive impact on consumption patterns, dietary patterns. And we some of the very, very forward looking um, elements or positive trends that we see was, there's an increase in multinational companies as well as African champions modernizing the food supply chains and building economies of scale. We also see that small medium enterprises in the, in the traders, the traders, the logistic operators, the processors constitute 85% of these food supply chains. So you have a very dynamic movement happening there. And also African governments have striven to strive to build a much more uh, business friendly or enabling environment to do business. Next slide, please. Um, so despite the fact, or, or because of the fact that African governments have a deep fiscal deficit as well as current account deficit, um, companies today have a role to play, uh, especially the ones that have the capacity, the resources to invest in the longer term need to step up. So in that context, even where I live right now in Cote d'Ivoire, we have companies like Olam that are investing in their cocoa producers, reaching out to over 100,000 cocoa producers and providing support in 12 cities in Cote d'Ivoire. These are the kind of longer term actions that actually build trust. And also in that context, there are three major areas where we see the, uh, a definite need for investment. And because there are so many needs, I'll, look, uh, I'll focus on the priorities. The priorities would be, as mentioned by one of the questions, to uh, increase the 
regional trade. Uh, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement was proposing to increase intra-regional trade from 13% to 25%. African leadership really needs to rally around that. Number two, I mentioned it, the small medium enterprises, African governments and leaders need to understand the role of small medium enterprises and, and clusters of small medium enterprises and invest in infrastructure like wholesale markets, like agro-industrial processing zones, to be able to support these small medium enterprises to grow. And, three, and the third area, finally, next slide please, is digitalization. Uh, there's a dynamic growth of enterprises in fintech and opportunities which are growing in the fourth industrial revolution. Governments and private sector need to have a enabling environment that is flexible to allow these enterprises and companies to grow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Atsuko. I think um, we actually want to go to some audience Q&A for Atsuko. Jillian and Atsuko. And um, let me bring in the first question that we have. Um, one of the questions that we have is from Dr. Godson who asks, um, are there are inadequate silos contributing to food security in Africa? This comes from Dr. Godson um, in Nigeria. Uh, thank you very much. I'll try to take that question. Inadequate silos, Dr. Godson. I think the issue really is about storage and warehousing. And as, as part of the SME universe of warehouse operators, I'm, I, I believe it's incredibly important to promote that sector. It's a very important sector. It's the interface between farmers and markets. And so aggregation is, is, is very critical. And it, it's, a, it's a role that the private sector can play. Um, the next question we have um, um, comes from East Africa. And the question is, what do you think of certain initiatives that are being implemented in Africa, such as, for example, the implementation of resource processing mechanisms for the production of fertilizers? I think uh, fertilizers are extremely, uh, sorry, I'm gonna try to understand or break down that question. So what I think about these facilities um, with regards to fertilizer, I think, I mean, uh, with regards to fertilizer, there's, there's a need to, to look at uh, how access, farmers can access agro inputs. It's, uh, we have agro input dealers, we have um, companies. I think it's a space that needs to, to definitely grow because more farmers need to use agro inputs, including fertilizer to increase their productivity, which is a big issue on the African continent. But it also all starts with the fact that Farmers can access markets, and in that context, what's very heartening to note is that only 20% of African uh, farming or African uh, food output is subsistence agriculture. 80% of it is linked to food supply chains. So there's a massive opportunity to make sure that productivity increases in line with more farmers being part of a more commercial agriculture, which is linked to food supply chains. Um, we have another uh, question coming out of Nigeria from Mr. Fesso Bright, and he says, how do we reconcile the consistent devaluation of currencies with Africa's ability to surmount its food consumption challenges? In other words, I'm asking about purchasing power parity. Okay, um, this might be a hard, um, this is an area of debate, actually. I know that in Nigeria, the devaluation is relatively unpopular. But the devaluation of the Nigerian Naira actually helps its own local food production to be much more competitive. Uh, so I think in a sense that using or capitalizing on devaluation because therefore imports become more expensive, uh, there is a huge opportunity for local production to be much more competitive. So like it has been done in Asian countries, I think African countries need to use the devaluation to their comparative advantage. Of course, when buying equipment and, you know, there are things which need to be imported. I think governments need to take measures to and allow for enterprises to grow. But I think for farmers, for local production, they should take the opportunity to make sure that they can compete with additional productivity because they will be much more competitive in a situation where 
uh, you know, imports are more expensive and therefore they can compete much more on the local markets. Very good. I'm going to turn, thank you very much, Atsuko. I'm going to turn it back to Jillian now. Excellent. Thank you, Atsuko. And I think one of the things you brought up is the importance of uh, SMEs, for example, in this sector and the role that the small medium enterprises actually play. I actually want to direct sort of a follow-on question to Linda um, to, to that point. Uh, you know, as, as a player in the financial sector, um, very often we hear from financial institutions um, about how difficult they find it to actually finance agriculture because it's so fragmented. It has a lot of these SMEs, has a lot of small farmers, um, and it also is very dependent on volatility in terms of pricing and weather. Uh, so a question to you, an open-ended one, how are financial institutions looking at the agriculture and food sector in Africa um, in the COVID-19 context? Uh, thank you, Gillian, and thank you to everybody who's joined us this afternoon for the discussion. Um, firstly, the statistics you've already shared uh, show that agriculture is of systemic importance to African economies, playing a critical role in development and economic growth, uh, contributing, as you've already pointed out, 23% uh, of Africa's GDP, employing about 70% of the continent's population and being a key driver for trade uh, on the continent. And uh, though Africa is a net importer of food, there are opportunities for Africa to become a major global food production hub. And the disruptions seen with COVID-19 have served to actually emphasize the need for Africa to push for self-reliance in basic food commodity production, such as maize, wheat, rice, proteins, but as well as developing capacity further up the supply chain in terms of food processing, uh, cold chains, and value addition of food products. So in order to build up resilience, we need to improve the linkage points through the uh, food supply chain and see how the supply chain can be simplified and shortened, as well as giving more visibility to players for better responsiveness. So existing vulnerabilities in Africa's agricultural food systems, combined with the demand um, and supply shocks that were referred to um, earlier, that flow from COVID-19 would be heightened unless mitigating actions are taken now and soon. Um, the second area I want to talk about when we look at this sector is actually the need for collaboration. Sustaining the sector beyond COVID-19 relies on collaboration of multiple players to remove the bottlenecks in the supply chain, which are exacerbating hardships and therefore our our ability to recover from the pandemic. So financial services organizations should be considering how they can counter uh, this situation by providing sustainable finance solutions across the entire value chain. Private sector investments um, in areas such as logistics, renewable energy, warehousing, other storage facilities, uh, agro-processing plants, and irrigation technologies would be crucial, as will public investments in road, rail, uh, infrastructure, um, as well as ports. As Africa's largest bank by assets, Standard Bank is very much aware that we work at the center of the economy and that it's our duty to do everything we can to help our clients to leverage these opportunities. And as part of these efforts, Standard Bank is working with development finance institutions and export um, agencies to develop sustainable finance solutions specifically for the sector. We are also funding projects that allow small scale farmers to transform themselves into outgrowers that supply commercial farmers. Smallholder farmers um, make up about 80% of the continent's farmer base, and thus an inclusive approach to the sector is very much required. Um, technology plays a pivotal role in Africa's agricultural sector and um, is set to enhance productivity, uh, communications, access to credit, insurance, access to market, amongst other things. Um, overall, though, serving to remove these bottlenecks I was referring to, and thus shortening the supply chain and allowing for more visibility and certainty. 
Um, these platforms were already there before COVID, but what we've seen is that COVID-19 has certainly accelerated digital adoption across most sectors, um, not just farming. And I believe that African states and farming groups would do well to um, adopt these platforms as well as smart farming concepts. For example, um, in Southern Africa, there are lots of examples of technology companies using um, uh, drones to monitor the health of crops, uh, Internet of Things to monitor and regulate soil moisture in order to save water and uh, avoid unnecessary um, irrigation. Um, another area for collaboration is with policymakers. Um, policymakers can contribute by creating and enabling invest, investment in environment. Uh, tariffs should be cost effective, uh, for instance, and policy certainly needs uh, to be certain um, in order to create uh, a, a more transparent and efficient environment. Um, uh, there was reference to the uh, Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement and um, the imminent impl uh, Im uh, implementation will lower tariffs and promote intra-African trade in agriculture, making the continent less reliant on food imports uh, from other regions. And through cross-border um, initiatives, Africa should strengthen its food export, uh, export prospects as well. So though it's hard to predict the form the pandemic will take, it's necessary for all these players to move from emergency response mode and shift to um, remove the inefficiencies in the supply chain in order to ensure the long-term sustainability of the agricultural supply chain. Thank you. Thanks very much, Linda, and particularly the point about needing to build these collaborations to actually strengthen the supply chain, I think is a really key one. Um, I think we also have a bunch of questions from the audience for you as well. Um, so I'll hand that over to Teresa uh, again. Olusegun Sansi, are you there and are you able to unmute yourself? All right, I will ask Shagun's question for him. Um, he says, what about providing collective processing infrastructures to preserve agricultural produce and prevent huge financial losses to smallholder farmers? This would positively impact food security in Africa, wouldn't it? Um, thank you. I think um, it's a very pertinent point, um, which can be broken down in a few ways. One um, is the issue of um, harvest, post-harvest losses. We, in, I think, uh, especially in the small holder farmer space, there is a lot of um, wastage and uh, post-harvest losses just due to the inability of uh, farmers to get their product either, either processed or to market. Um, and there are initiatives right now uh, in the aggregation space that should hopefully address this issue um, and ensure that there is inc uh, inclusivity and giving uh, smallholder farmers access. The role that smallholder farmers play in this space cannot be uh, overemphasized. Thank you very much. We're going to go now to um, Tiki. Uh, Tiki Barnard, can you hear us? I can. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, uh, so, so Linda, I just wanted to ask you about the Afri, your views on the Africa continental free trade area, because I think there's, you know, there's a huge expectation, um, you know, with the implementation of the Africa continental free trade area. And the question that I have is that, do you see the informal sector benefiting you know, in, in, a, in, a, in an enormous way from the Africa continental free trade area because we will be going beyond borders. But then also, how can the, the, the private sector, you know, help the informal sector to actually, you know, I don't know, try and implement this successfully? I don't know what your views are on the AFCFTA. I think the um, free trade um, area, is actually was actually put together in order to liberalize markets, to deepen economic integration, and to um, to have an inclusive social economic uh, development strategy. 
the whole point of um, of the informal markets having access now to, um, to to larger transactability, I think the it, the, the free trade uh, area should actually help, as, as as long as the linkages that I was referring to in the presentation are actually strengthened. If we strengthen the linkages throughout the entire value chain, um, you should see the informal market now having access. To, um, to, to more trading platforms. Um, we will move on to Mandla in South Africa. Can you hear us, Mandla? I can hear you guys loud and clear. <laughs> Thank you, Mandla. Would you like to ask your question of Linda, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I think you mentioned uh, a very valid point around the, the importance of digital adoption. Uh, and you mentioned examples of, I think, companies that we see here in South Africa that are deploying drones and stuff. But what is the bank, what do you think financial institutions generally and the bank could do to ensure that some of these technologies work at a smallholder farmer level? Because, uh, you know, drone work and stuff is not going to do much for two hectare farms and so forth but we need other technologies like digital soil testing, like maybe satellite monitoring of crops, insurance services uh, for smallholder farmers, which are digitally enabled. What, what role do you think uh, financial institutions can play to accelerate the move towards digital adoption and use in smallholder farming? And Manla, I think it would be helpful for Linda to know your platform, where are you calling from and what is your, what is your organization, what do you do? Okay, so I'm from, I'm, I'm, I'm from uh, Solidaridad. Uh, we are a, an NGO that is based uh, out of uh, South Africa and also East Africa and uh, West Africa here on the African continent. So in terms of um, the view from uh, finance, the finance sector, the, I, I would agree that some um, agri-techs is, are more uh, applicable to the commercial side and whilst others can be used um, on the smallholder side. But the, the, but the point is to um, allow for more visibility, especially from financiers in order to um, make, in order to assist us in making perhaps uh, credit, credit decisions and insurance decisions. Currently Standard Bank is involved in um, in putting together, um, in bringing together agritechs as well as um, other other players for the sole benefit of um, small scale farmers. And we're in the middle of a, um, a proof of concept in Uganda with um, small scale farmers um, where we are providing uh, various um, various technology, technological and um, uh, and training uh, assistance in order to, to address the, um, the issues that small scale farmers would have on productivity and efficiencies. Um, and then we have a question that has come in from Imani Ellis. Um, Imani asks, to what extent are agriculture and health sector policies linked in order to reduce reliance on imported products that result in poor health outcomes such as increased rates of diabetes and other health challenges versus increased production of nutrient-rich local agricultural products such as phoneo. The ability of uh, a nation and of people to, to have access to the correct, uh, to the correct foods um, indirectly um, does speak to the, you know, to the health and the strength of, of a population. But I might have to refer to the other panelists because uh, health is certainly not my forte. Actually, um, maybe if I could throw that question over a little bit to Atsuko. I mean, one of the biggest concerns, um, if you recall, um, as we've discussed, is as people reduce their incomes, that actually will downgrade their nutrition as well and actually start purchasing less nutritious foods. Um, so actually, I'm curious to hear from you, Atsuko, on, on how you think the nutrition and ag um, discussion work together. That linkage to being able to access nutritious food is absolutely critical. And that's why this new food system has to 
uh, support creating that demand, creating that purchasing power, creating, creating the capacity to ensure that nutritious food is, is accessible. And let's see, we have um, Andrea Khan. Let's see if Andrea can unmute. Are you there, Andrea? Uh, we are based in the United States, but are working with um, groups in various African countries and trying to bring some agriculture and water solutions to the continent. Of course, um, getting the people willing on that side and the systems and the plans in place, we have business plans, we have proven solutions. Issue that we often run into is um, that startup money to get the pilot project going and to start to implement solutions on the continent there. It seems that a lot of the international investors are one hesitant about Africa at this point in time with COVID and all that, extremely hesitant. And then oftentimes when it comes to agriculture projects, they're even more scared because of the uncertainty in that. And I was wondering if you guys could suggest, you know, where do organizations like us go to start to implement these solutions? Hi, Andrea. I, um, I think uh, what you're trying to do is uh, very commendable and uh, very important. In terms of where to start, the issue is uh, probably um, a, multi, a, a multi-sector play. In, in, in various country, countries, there should be a policy that should support um, such investments. And um, it goes back to the issue of collaboration. I would suggest looking at social impact funds um, as well as the private sector. You would find that there will be uh, private sector players um, that would be already looking at um, water solutions. Um, and um, even though you're coming from, uh, from uh, outside Africa, you're coming from the US, We've tried, um, we tried and tested um, um, solutions. I would also say, you know, partnering with local financiers who actually know the the landscape would be a very good starting point. Um, Julie, I'm going to hand it back over to you, but I am going to ask you to um, switch. Um, instead of going to Mezu, we're going to ask you to go to Kola because Mezu is having a technical problem. So we uh, will have to go with Kola and come back to Mezu at the end, if you don't mind, Julie. No problem. And Andrea, we will pick up a little bit more on this investment topic with Mezu when, when we're able to get him back online. Um, but, but Kola, um, so first off, congratulations. Uh, my hero, Bob Angona, is doing 75,000 uh, hectares of maize at this point and working with 100,000 smallholder farmers. So you are really on the ground um, of this, this reality and you, you're seeing every day what the impact is as an agri agribusiness to, to farmers. Um, so, so two questions for you. Uh, one is how has COVID-19 impacted agribusiness and farmers on the ground? Um, of course, we've talked at a very macro level here, but would love to hear, you know, what the story is is on the ground. Um, and the second is, as an agribusiness, uh, what role do you think agribusiness can play to mitigate some of the impacts um, or drive some of the investments and collaborations that we've talked about um, so far? Wonderful. Well, thank you uh, so much, Jillian, for uh, the kind words. Greatly appreciated. Now, uh, I must admit, we, uh, we've not done this alone. We've been fortunate and had this incredible group of partners. Um, now, uh, specifically to, uh, to the question around, you know, um, impact to farmers on the ground. I think, thankfully, uh, so far, I think the impact has been minimal. I think from a health standpoint, we have not seen uh, particular uh, health challenges uh, in the geographic areas that we operate. Um, the biggest impact, uh, quite frankly, has been a disruption in supply chains. Um, and I think particularly uh, uh, if you look at the, you know, the timing uh, in our area right now, basically the planting season kicks off for farmers in May, June. And so uh, March, April is a major period of time where you start seeing a significant amount of uh, the agricultural inputs, fertilizer, seeds, chemicals start moving into those, those communities. Um, so from a timing standpoint, it was a particular challenge. Um, I think thankfully for, uh, for uh, the uh, you know, tens of thousands of uh, members that we work with in Babangona, that was mitigated because uh, I think the nature of our model is we, we plan quite, 
quite far in advance. And uh, typically by the end of March, most all of our inputs for the season for the you know thousands and thousands, nearly I think 75,000 uh, acres of, uh, of product were in our stores. Uh, but I think the 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 average farmer is probably going to see an increase this season in terms of uh, input costs uh, because of lack of availability and uh, additional costs that uh, that the supply chain had to bear to get those products there on time. Now, uh, specifically on the on the question around uh, you know what is a role that uh, that uh, agribusinesses can play to help mitigate for some of the some of the uh, challenges of of COVID, I think I can kind of walk through what we've uh, the approach that we've taken. Uh, the approach we've taken really has fallen into three buckets. Uh, the first was really around, um, around awareness. Uh, the reality is, you know, we live in a world where everybody has WhatsApp and you've probably been inundated with, uh, with, with messages and awareness on COVID. But the reality is for the average rural inhabitant, uh, they, uh, A, may not have WhatsApp because they don't have a smartphone, and B, they, uh, they often don't have access to data. Right. Um, so we recognize this as a key challenge and actually uh, immediately uh, the issue of around COVID came up. We actually went out and printed about 120,000 posters, uh, which we put up uh, in you know, thousands and thousands of uh, remote villages um, to, uh, uh, to help. And these posters were very, uh, very visually, uh, not so much written, but more visual. Um, and then in addition, uh, we also went out and actually and partnered with key organizations uh, put together about a five minute, uh, very detailed um, nine steps that you can protect yourself and your family uh, from getting COVID. And we put that out in all of the, translated that into all the major local languages. And because of the limited access of data in these communities, we actually sent that out over the phone lines as a robocall to thousands and thousands of people. Uh, after you take care of awareness, you actually now need to provide some level of protection uh, for, for folks. And, uh, and you know, as we all know with COVID, the big issue is around hand washing. Uh, and many of these rural communities, the reality is that uh, access to running water can be a key constraint. Um, and so uh, recognizing that as a key constraint, we actually went out and uh, procured about nearly a tanker of, uh, of um, of hand sanitizers, about 22,000 liters of hand sanitizers, uh, which we then distributed to about 150,000 uh, people in remote rural communities that had limited access to water. Now, the final challenge uh, that these communities, and really, I think most communities, both urban and rural, would face with, with COVID was really the impact on livelihoods. Um, I think in Nigeria alone, uh, the vice president came out recently uh, with a report from the National Bureau of Statistics that nearly 40 million people by the end of this year may lose their jobs uh, because of the economic fallout from COVID. Um, and, and, and so recognizing this immediate shock and, and the, the fact that many, uh, many uh, countries uh, across the continent don't have uh, uh, a um, social safety net, uh, we recognize that really at the end of the day, it is uh, there. It, it's the responsibility may fall on those in the in those uh, communities who have a little bit more uh, during these tough times. And so uh, we actually, I think most people think of Babangona as a um, as an agricultural company or a financing company, but the reality is we actually are uh, uh, one of the single largest agri tech companies on the continent. Actually, one out of four of our employees is in, uh, in, agri is in our tech team. And so we've developed really very uh, robust set of applications, over 36 applications today. Um, uh, and uh, we were able to take one of those applications, which is our uh, logistics tech application that today moves you know, hundreds of thousands of metric tons of product to uh, people at the bottom of the pyramid. And we're able to, within 72 hours, redeploy that to an emergency food relief platform that can now move, you know, uh, that today has moved nearly 200,000 uh, meals uh, to individuals at the bottom of the pyramid across nationally, across the country. And we did this really in partnership with an amazing group of private sector and public sector partners, a coalition of over 30 partners. So I think the reality is, you know, is I think as, as, as organizations leveraging the skills and talents that you have to really hit these three key buckets of awareness, of uh, protection, and finally uh, around supporting livelihoods. To me, I think are really the key roles that uh, that that agribusiness players can can do.
Amazing, and thank you, Cola, for the amazing work that you're doing on the ground. Um, before we go to the audience, I, I just have a follow-up question, actually, to something you mentioned. Um, we had an earlier question from the audience around uh, technology, because we've talked so far about the importance of digitization uh, for the long-term food system in, in Africa, and yet uh, we have this, this challenge as well, as you've mentioned, with many farmers not having data access or not having smartphones. <laughs> Uh, so what is the role that digitization can play? Um, and as an agribusiness that is actually tech enabled, what are some of the activities that you think value chain players can adopt in terms of digitization to actually strengthen, strengthen the system? Well, I think um, you know, the, the importance of technology in working in the, in the African agricultural context, particularly because of the, uh, you're working with smallholder farmers, which at the end of the day, uh, the key challenge of working with smallholder farmers is that fragmentation and cost to serve, right? Um, and so without technology, it's a non-starter. And I think that's why for us from day one, we've been doing this nine years, um, technology has been at the heart of everything that we do. Um, so I think there are, uh, so maybe I'll just kind of give a, a brief sense of kind of our technology journey, right? Um, I think as an organization, um, you know, fundamentally what we've had to, uh, to, to, to do is kind of go through a few key phases. You know, the first is really around uh, using technology to solve your human capital constraint that you might face uh, uh, in operating in some of these environments, right? And so what, what technology enables you to do is, uh, is really um, ensure that you're able to, uh, to uh, in a sense, leverage the technology to make the work simpler, right? And so what that enables you to do is basically, uh, as you're looking to scale and an organization like Babangona today, you know, we've got 1,250 uh, team members. Uh, we have you know, Nigeria's largest fleet of motorcycles, hundreds and hundreds of motorcycles running around everywhere every day, um, uh, covering an area equivalent to five Manhattans. Um, and so, uh, so you know, the ability to use technology to scale is very, very important. Now, I think the second piece uh, as around the using technology, as I mentioned previously, around the logistics side of things. Uh, the logistics of getting, uh, because not only do we run uh, an inbound logistics system, getting you know, tens of thousands of metric tons, I think in the next 12 months, we'll be moving nearly 50,000 metric tons. That's you know, five ocean liners worth of uh, agricultural inputs to tens of thousands of uh, smallholder farmers at you know, two, 3,000 different distribution points. But we also run an outbound logistics system, right? Where our farmers this year will be producing around 120,000 metric tons of grain. That's like 12 ocean liners worth of grain. You've got to move out and deal with in about a four to six week period of time. So using technology uh, uh, to get to on the logistics side is very, very critical. Now, the, the next leap that we've really been driving is driven by the fact that we have really an unparalleled access to data, right? When you have you know, uh, tens of thousands of smallholder farmers that you know almost anything about, right? And you have uh, field officers that are going out and visiting thousands and thousands of fields every day, capturing data on the progress and growth about those fields and we know exactly when they planted, what inputs they applied, so on and so on and so forth. That data now you can basically use to train very powerful and predictive algorithms uh, that can now really transform the way that farmers think about uh, uh, how to manage their farms and empower those farmers to actually, at the end of the day, take ownership of those, of, of, of the full, um, uh, uh, use those predictive algorithms to take ownership of the, of the full aspect of their farming operation and make sure that they're doing the right thing at the right time in the right way. Uh, we've already done this. I think we launched the first artificial intelligence application that actually is um, a, um, helps, uh, is a uh, operation, operational model to support smallholder farmers on the continent. Um, and we're continuously enhancing those, uh, those artificial intelligence models uh, daily. Amazing. Uh, and again, super exciting work. Uh, I think we have a bunch of questions from the audience uh, as well for you, Kula. So I'll hand it over to Teresa to, to help with this. Jay says, thanks, Kula Masha, for this insightful information. Really on point. My question is this, how does protection come? How does this protection come to play? in the increase of production of crops and increased access to food and agricultural export? 
So, um, so I think you know what we've been able to demonstrate uh, with Babangona is that in a very short period of time, uh, talking about one season, you're able to get a very large number of farmers to get yields that are typically about two times the national average, to get net incomes that are typically about two and a half times the national average. So, we're, so the typical Babangona farmer is actually today on par with the average farmer in you know Brazil. Uh, Southeast Asia, China, so on and so forth, in terms of productivity. And so we've been able to demonstrate that you can do this at very, very uh, large scale. And most importantly, do this financially sustainably, right? We've been able to demonstrate that you can do this utilizing a model. You can actually, uh, you know, be able to raise commercial debt against. You can operate at a, at a positive net income, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and I think that's, that's the critical piece to actually take this to even greater scale. At the end of the day, the, what we're thinking about, what needs to happen on the African continent is not you know, supporting you know, tens of thousands of farmers, which we do today, but to think about supporting 150 million farmers tomorrow and being able to raise you know, you know, hundreds of million dollars in, in, in financing to support farmers at that scale. And really that's uh, hundreds of, as we, about, we estimate somewhere in the range about $100 billion to support farmers at that scale. And so that's, uh, that's really where, where we're thinking. Tell us where you're calling from briefly, and then please give us your question directly to Kola. I'm calling from Uganda, and um, I'm inquiring as to whether we can bring back butter trade. Is it possible? Some countries are producing goods, yet money is not forthcoming. Can we please rethink about butter trade between states between countries. Thank you very much, panelists. And I'll just make sure you heard the full question, um, Cola, that she emailed in, which is, um, can you talk about cost sharing with farmers uh, so, that you can, and so that the farmers can share in profits um, and also talk about advancing loans because it's difficult for poor Africans to engage financially? So I think, you know, hands down, um, you know, I think access to finance is the single biggest challenge uh, in impeding the sector. Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, if a, if a, if a smallholder farmer is unable to access that, the, the inputs they need to invest in their farm, it's, it's really, a, they don't have the capital to purchase those fertilizer seeds chemicals today. Now, what we've been able to do to uh, enable that is really, uh, you, know, you know, look at, how you finance smallholder farmers really from the ground up and say, how do we ensure that, um, that uh, we, uh, we look at all the key risks associated with that? So we've actually developed what we call our eight levels of risk mitigation that holistically looks at every possible um, uh, risk that a smallholder farmer may face and put in place very sophisticated um, uh, mitigants uh, to deal with that. And that's what's enabled us to now, you know, we've, we've been doing this nine years, uh, provided tens of millions of dollars to, you know, I think we've provided over 200,000 loans to smallholder farmers and operating at over a 98% of the payment rate. Thank you, Paula. We have another question coming in from South Africa from um, an executive at Cargill, Brenda Apia-Oka. Hi, everyone. Um, my question is simple. So in trying to success, and reaping the benefits of agri-tech innovations requires that we invest in digital literacy as well as digital skills development. So simply, what are we doing to invest in these areas? Because it will make sure that whatever we develop and how we innovate actually sticks sustainably and farmers benefit and so do customers. Uh, so it's a very good point, Brenda. And I think, you know, I think it's one of the reasons, you know, as, as an organization, we have, uh, you know, I think we've got probably as an organization state, probably you know, 10 to 12 individuals whose job it is, is just in product development, right, within the organization on the tech side. And these individuals go out um, and gather information and data on our users and are able to basically take that to develop, uh, you know, uh, user interfaces uh, and that are able to ensure that we're meeting our customer uh, where they are today. And I think it's very important that we have to actually continue to invest over time in enhancing uh, the, the skill level of our customer. But I think the important thing is because we don't have a lot of time, we've got to solve these problems today. Uh, you know, we are trying to develop very um, uh, applications where the user interface is such that it's exceptionally easy 
for people to uh, to to uh, to learn and uh, to learn it. I think we've actually, um, to, for as an example, you know, one of the applications that we're de uh, developing right now, uh, we actually are designing to be zero clicks, right? So think of that. That's an application that you don't even have to press one button, right? The application knows where you are. The application uh, tells you what to do, and literally, you're able to just bring it out of your pocket, and it just knows what to do. Um, so that's that's the, the the type of work that we're doing right now. Yes, Osas, oh, please please proceed. Tell us your full name, your company, and where you're calling from. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Osas. I'm calling from Milan. I I'm a research student in the Department of Biotechnology here at the University of Milan. Um, how do you think the cooperation of biotechnology can help mitigate um, production shock, especially as um, we're going to enter into the new planting season? Well, I think um, I think I, I, I'll answer that more broadly, right? At the at the end of the day, um, I think throughout history, uh, people have been wary of new technology, uh, many times, uh, rightfully so. Um, I think the question around biotechnology, uh, it's been around for a very long time, and the reality is the markets that have were most against biotechnology are actually the markets today that are actually adopting that biotechnology. Now, unfortunately, I think uh, uh, Africa as a continent um, is probably uh, behind the times in adapting some of this new technology. Uh, if you look at, uh, uh, and fundamentally, um, I think that uh, responsible adoption of this type of technology will have a phenomenal impact on ensuring that, uh, that uh, the farmers can, can dramatically improve their productivity. I think if you look at Nigeria as an example, I remember, uh, when we started Babangona in 2012, I went out and looked for the best seed I could find. And that seed was called Oba 98. And the reason it was called Oba 98 was because it was released in 1998. So think about that. Farmers are using, have available to them, 14-year-old technology. I would like you to use a 14-year-old laptop today. And let's see how productive you are. Thank you, Cola. All right, Jillian, we're going to come back over to you now and ask you to, uh, we've got Mezu back online. Mezu, thank you for logging back in. I'll hand it back to you and Jillian to conclude the panel. Thank you and, and great to have you back, Mezu. Um, we've talked a lot about investment here, right? Uh, you know, need for investment in SMEs, investment in storage, investment in farmers, investment in tech, um, and uh, your force and investor in agribusiness in, in agriculture in Africa. Uh, so would love to hear from you around uh, this concern that COVID-19 means investment is going to fly away, uh, especially from a sector like this. Uh, and, you know, as an investor, what opportunities do you actually see in COVID-19 versus just the challenges? Uh, thank you, Julian. And as, as context, I think there's an increased realization for many people about how critical and strategic this sector is and how interlinked um, a lot of our uh, food supply chain is within country and across the region. And just to touch on a, a, a couple of different things. So as Suko mentioned a little bit earlier about food logistics disruptions. Uh, we have seen some of this in some of our portfolio companies, both on having seasonal labor available to work, some of our commercial farms. Uh, we've seen uh, transportation, um, difficulty in moving crop around uh, impact um, transportation costs of goods and in particular with our companies that are very active in the uh, cassava and rice value chains processing cassava to starch and rice to finish product we've seen 30 40 percent uh, increase in input materials um, coming in um, access to markets um, is also quite key um, I think we've heard some conversation in, in, in the US, Europe, uh, producers dumping milk because they can't get milk to markets. We've had some uh, livestock rares having to call livestock because the processing plants are not working and this is all internationally. But to give context um, in our market, um, there's, there are millions of dollars worth of frozen chicken in storerooms right now with many producers because they can't get these volumes to market, not only because of the supply side, but also demand since many hotels, fast food retailers, eateries are, are closed down. 
So access to markets also impacting some of this dynamic. Um, food security as well. Um, if you think of school feeding programs, um, not many initiatives across the continent, but there are initiatives. Uh, one of our companies, um, Ellen's at Integrated Farms, have fed, you know, in partnership with Cano State, 1.2 million uh, children in schools in 2019. Uh, since schools closed down, uh, that food is not available for those kids going to school, and, and this replicates itself uh, not only across continent but you know across the world. And then even if we think of food retail, the structure of our food retail systems uh, really needs to be changed and modified. Um, open air markets are uh, quite dense. Um, um, even if we think of going to supermarket retail, just ensuring the safety of ourselves as we engage uh, this environment is, is, is important. Now, as an investor, there are dual issues we face or, or think about. So the first is, from an opportunity perspective, um, there are a number of different things that sort of reinforce uh, why we're an investor in this space, which is you know, local supply chains, to the degree you have a company that has a strong, robust local supply chain and producing products to um, distribute and sell into domestic or regional markets, uh, enables you to be resilient during this time and this huge opportunity for you. So for us, we see more opportunities and we're planning to invest more in companies that have um, robust supply chains, some import substitution plays, and believe there's real um, opportunity there. Now, on the other hand, we've seen um, companies also within our portfolio that are export focused, commodities export focused. And I think this is where we've seen more challenges. Um, as demand gets impacted in different international markets for different commodities, it has ripple effects um, you know, through the chain all the way down to the producers here. And I think in your pre presentation earlier, Jillian, you also talked a little bit about that, some of that international uh, demand disruption. And we are seeing that in, in some of our, our companies. Now, from a challenge uh, perspective, I think the, the key issues that we worry about are um, currency, FS, uh, currency risk, um, devaluation, and, and uh, liquidity uh, in the market. So our capital is dollar-based. We need to do, it, it deploy this capital uh, many times in local currency. And to the degree there's the risk of devaluation, it has huge impact on our ability to deploy. Now we do expect some devaluation in the different markets we're in, but I think what is more important is predictability of that, um, that currency trend uh, versus where you have a managed process that makes it more difficult to actually determine where currency could go and how volatile it could be. And then the other issue as well, which is more particular to Nigeria is, um, when you are ready to take money out, do you have the liquidity to actually access dollars to take money out? And to the degree there is uncertainty, then there's an implicit risk premium you put in place um, within your investments as you look at opportunities. Now, do I believe there will be um, capital leaving the region and not focused on agriculture? I think the answer is no, because um, this is one of the great, you know, untapped markets left, huge amount of arable land. The dem demographics make sense in terms of large population growing, uh, consuming more foods. Um, and I think the real question for an investor is, um, where are those companies that have built resilient, local, robust value chains and in a, in a devaluation environment, or where there's currency devaluation, um, their products will be more competitive. I think this was touched a little bit earlier, to consumers um, versus imported products. Um, I think these are really, you know, from risk, you know, what keeps us up at night, but where we also see opportunity as well. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, over to some audience questions um, for Mesu. Thank you, thank you, Mesu, thank you, Jillian. Um, Kidest, can you hear us? I think Kidest, can you tell us where you're calling in from? Uh, I'm calling from Nairobi, Kenya. I'm, I work with the Trade and Development Bank. My question is actually, well, it could be for Ms. Atsuko Toda or for any of the panelists. Uh, what kind of policy models would you highlight for countries uh, that would be grappling with finding the right strategy to move away from food importation to self-reliance in agriculture, especially? when there are weak value chains in, in many countries currently. Thank you. I, 
I think for, for different countries, I guess the, the, the first key thing is to understand where can you build a competitive advantage in a particular value chain. And when you determine, because there's some value chains where it just doesn't make sense and you definitely need to import that crop. I mean, wheat is a, is a perfect example. And the others where you can build that competitive advantage and then government policy can be quite supportive in, in ensuring you build, further build that capacity. And there they can be a range of different measures from um, measured tariffs with you know, clearly defined timelines to um, financing support to those particular value chains to ensure further additional investments into those sectors. I mean, if we think about Nigeria in particular, there's been um, significant support for both the cassava and the rice value chains over the years. Um, there's been a range of initiatives from um, subsidized financing the sector to favorable tariffs. And that has led to different private sector players, put in, including us, putting significant amounts of money to build up um, on the cassava side starch in the sweetener related operations. And um, it makes sense because you know, Nigeria is one of the largest growers of cassava in the world. We can get international type yields. And the question is really ensuring you have the lead time to build up that operation capacity and support. Um, but a mix of um, you know, tariffs, policies, financing for those value chains where you can build advantage, um, I think is, is, and I want to stress that is, uh, could be helpful. Tiko, did you, would you like to add anything to that since I think the question is partly also addressed to you? Okay, thanks a lot, Jillian. Thank you, Kidis, for the question. I think Mizo answered it very comprehensively. But I just wanted to kind of draw the audience away from this idea of self-reliance. I think it's really important that countries do not pursue protectionist policies. And I, I see the conversation going towards things like food sovereignty. And this is not the issue. The issue right now is regional integration. And the two Mizo's point, shorter resilient supply chains. And there are areas of production in Africa that can, are producing surplus that really can feed markets. So I'm really hoping that we together as a group and as a, a, as a platform can really move towards a much more forward look with regards to the issue of food security, because that will benefit everybody. Please tell us your title, your organization, where you're calling from. All right, I'm the secretary to the board of the Agricultural Mechanization Association of Nigeria. I want to know what, um, Linda, what they have, the, one of the biggest banks in Africa. I want to know how are they supporting mechanization service providers? What are they trying to do to solve the mechanization problem when it comes to finance? Thank you um, very much for your time. Thank you, Amino, for your question. Um, uh, thank you, Amino. I agree fully that. Um, mechanization and um, the application of appropriate technologies is um, critical to improving and increasing um, production, um, agricultural production. In terms of um, specifically what are financial institutions doing on um, mechanization, our approach to agriculture is really looking at the entire value chain um, and seeing where various components uh, fit into, into the value chain. So um, um, how would I say, we, we wouldn't look at, uh, at mechanization on its own, we would look at how that feeds into the how 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 that feeds into the ecosystem, and see um, if there are enough uh, if there are adequate mitigants uh, to the risks around that ecosystem in order to uh, encourage us to participate and to partner with that um, with that player. I hope um, I've understood the question. Actually, Mezu, do you have uh, also as being on the ground in Nigeria and having a farming business as well? I'd love to hear your perspective on this mechanization question as well. Sure, no, sure, definitely very important um, to ensure efficiency. Um, as context, we have two large scale farming operations. We have 2,000 hectares rice in Anambra in Nigeria and 13,000 hectares uh, farmland in Kogi State, of which we're cultivating 1,004 
uh, on cassava and we're using high-end combines, half a million dollar type equipment, so very high tech on the commercial farming side. But specific for how we use that equipment to also engage with smallholders. For our cassava operation, we have lots of land that we are not farming ourselves, but is available for ingrowers, small farmers farming our land. And we use our equipment to help them with a range of different things um, from a, the, the clearing side harvesting. So trying to lever our equipment to work with the outgrowers we also source from to feed into our operation. Um, so there's a need. Um, it's, it's not easy to get financing um, if you are a, of course, small farmer um, and need these facilities. But I think where we try to engage with mechanization is using the tools we have to then use to support the small farmers that um, we work with. Um, and now we are going to go to Kelvin Uwabi, who is calling in. He is the head of the Edo State Investment Promotion Office in Nigeria. Yes, um, uh, my question uh, is, what do governments in Africa need to prioritize to attract investors into the agricultural space during and post COVID-19? Knowing that uh, in Africa, we actually have the resources. Thank you. Whether COVID or not, how do we bring the capital in? And how do we ensure that uh, whether it's international capital or it's domestic capital, it easily gets to um, the sectors uh, that need it? And uh, Edo State, I know Edo State very well. I'll, I'll speak from Nigeria context. Um, security. Um, agriculture is largely in rural areas. You need to be able to have teams of people, um, uh, investors, teams of people, employees, willing and able to go and engage in rural areas. And to the degree that safety is an issue, it becomes problematic. And I mentioned this because the security budgets that we have in a number of our, our portfolio companies, and I know many of the larger players who are active in the sector have, um, is quite high. And it's an expense that shouldn't be there. You shouldn't need to have um, 10, 15, you know, policemen or soldiers guarding farmland. It just doesn't make economic sense. So security is critical and is, is government-led. And I know specifically in Edo State, I know the current government has been doing quite a bit around security in Edo State. I think the other thing to think about is rural roads and how do you ensure um, crop can get from rural communities to urban centers. And rural road infrastructure is um, quite helpful. And um, and to give an example, Benue State in Nigeria is an agricultural hub, but the road network to get stuff out of Benue State is, is terrible um, and it's tough. And there's the, the airports as well. So how do you, um, if you're a state or a country, how do you ensure you can actually, um, to attract investors, you want to make sure that an investor that's willing to put in significant amounts of money to a particular location can actually get those products out. Now, if we leave that aside and say, and because this would attract domestic international investors, so separate from that, from a macro perspective, is just consistency and transparency of, uh, you know, macroeconomic policy. And if you're bringing in capital, um, wherever that capital is coming from internationally, you want to have um, the sure that you can bring money in and take money in, take money out uh, when you are able. And I think there's a concern that there's roughly, I mean, there's a recent report in Business Day that roughly, uh, Business Day newspapers in Nigeria, that there's roughly eight you know, billion dollars trapped in Nigeria looking for currency to, to get out. So as we're thinking about how do you attract, um, and you compare Nigeria to Egypt, for example, where with a more flexible exchange rate, they've attracted more capital in a shorter period of time, even with similar you know, macroeconomic um, challenges there. So it's consistency of policy and it's looking at, you know, very, you know, bare, you know, buckle, you know, nuts and bolts issues um, that will make anybody comfortable, um, you know, investing and traveling around that particular country, um, you know, that particular region. Um, yeah. If I could just uh, echo that point on rural roads, um, I think fundamentally, um, if there's one thing that governments can do, it is that investment in rural in, in rural road infrastructure. I think we they don't fully, I'm not sure it's fully comprehend what the impact is. There are extensive studies that have shown that yield and productivity of farmers 
is that is linearly uh, related to the dis to the distance from a major urban center, uh, because fundamentally what happens is when you have poor rural road networks, um, it takes uh, it, it, uh, you're, you're adding on significant cost to that input by the time it gets to the farmer. So uh, that farmer is ability to invest goes down significantly. In addition, as you're pulling out those, those, uh, the outputs, you are adding significant cost to that. So that means at the end of the day, when that output gets to the, to the, to the major urban center, it's a price at the same, at the same amount. So that means that the farmer, the farm gate price is significantly lower. So by having poor rural roads, you're making it more expensive for a farmer to farm. And you're making their return on investment much lower. And so if there is a single act, and this has been done in many countries, I think the cocoa board in China and in Ghana is probably one of the best examples of the investment that they've made. That is the single best thing that government can do. That's great. Um, I also important. have one more um, point. Studies have shown that yields, when you actually do this, yields go up dramatically because farmers are now ready to invest. Um, one more point in terms of what can governments do to attract um, investment investors is the enforceability of contracts uh, and the legal framework. If an invest, just as um, Mezu said, um, an investor wants to know that they can get their money in and get it out. They also want to know that uh, in the case of any dispute or um, any misunderstandings, there is uh, an objective and uh, a fair um, legal system and the ability to enforce the contract and the understanding that was signed up on. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. All right, we're going to have one last question, and um, thank you for all those uh, responses to the last one. So we'll have to go quickly for the, for the last question. We're going to invite um, Susan Kitaiga, who um, you'd mentioned cocoa uh, cola. Susan heads the International Cocoa Association for Kenya. Susan? Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Susan Kitaiga. I'm calling from Nairobi, Kenya. I had two questions, but I think you have said I can ask one. And uh, uh, the both, I guess, pretty short. I work for ICCO Corporation as the country manager. So my first question is, uh, how are we protecting our farmers from over indebtedness? So for the panelists who are working on providing financial solutions, what are some of the things you're doing to provide to protect the farmers from over indebtedness? And uh, because it's something that we've seen over the years, farmers uh, end up having uh, to struggle and some are left in worse of pos uh, positions than before. Then my second question is on the issue that uh, is really troubling us uh, uh, in Kenya and I'm sure in other parts of Africa is the issue of corruption. So we have some of the policies that you're talking about, some of the solutions that you're suggesting. The, they have, uh, we've been having conversations around this. We have policies, good policies, but when it comes to implementation, they're left in the shelves because uh, either uh, the funds are misappropriated or, you know, just uh, generally cor corruption, which they admit uh, as politicians, they say, yes, there's corruption, but we leave it at that. We've become very cynical. We just say, oh, there's corruption and we leave it at that. What can we do? So I answer the first question. Um, maybe Mizu or Kola, uh, both of you work in the, the financial space. Uh, and I think the question is around, do, do those loans actually make farmers more indebted? And what do we do to mitigate that? So sure. it's, it's an interesting question because there, there's, there, at least from the Africa context, there, um, there are more situations where farmers actually can't get access to financing versus them having access and then, you know, building up indebtedness. So I know in places, you know, like India, for example, there are more cases of that happening. But I, I think the, the, the way um, for the financing that's available primarily in Nigeria for farmers, it tends to be linked to off-takers. So if you have um, you know, an outgoer scheme, an off-taker, the Central Bank of Nigeria has an anchor borrower scheme financing to farmers um, you know, backed by off-takes from processors who would then buy that crop and then pay back, um, pay back the loans. So that structure helps uh, mitigate this risk and minimize that risk. So I would, I would say there's probably less of an issue of that from our context and more a need for further access to finance. Great, I see that we're coming up on the top of the hour. And so does someone want to tackle the corruption question that was asked? 
Well, I think I'm um, happy to, to, to touch on that one as, uh, and, and, and the, uh, the first one slightly. So I think on the, on the first one, with regards to the debt, I think at the end of the day, it's to ensure that the farmers uh, are able to, uh, to, to, uh, to make enough in income to service that debt. And so for us, what we've ensured that we've implemented into our model is, uh, is every single person we finance, we visit their farm. We want to make sure that that farm has a possibility to ensure that it's productive, that it's uh, they're able to going to get a good ROI. And if that farm is not right for crop A, it may be recommend that they farm crop B. Um, and that really goes that goes down to uh, to uh, for us as part of the loan package, we actually visit that farm every two to four weeks to give advice and guidance throughout the season, season to ensure that 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 farm is successful. Now, on the, on the corruption challenge, I think the reality is that, um, you know, our experience actually has been uh, that uh, uh, we have not actually seen, I think we have not seen as much corruption as I think is actually highlighted. Um, I think the reality is that uh, typically what you find and where you find corruption most is when people are doing uh, business directly with governments. Uh, I think as uh, as if you can go out and try as much as possible to engage with uh, with the consumer directly, I think your know, reality most of those issues are are mitigated. Well, thank you. I think we're going to turn now to Jillian, who's going to give us um, some summary and and closing remarks. Wonderful. Thank you. I just I just want to reflect on the poll that we did before we started this this panel discussion, where nearly. 50% of you said you were worried about food security, and 80% of you uh, really wanted to focus on reliance um, as, as, a, as a key mechanism to address that. Um, so, so just in summary from some of the conversation here, and I'll ask each of the panelists to give me maybe one, one major takeaway um, after I've done this quick summary. Uh, I think if, if there are a couple things I would leave you with, one is the difference between resilience and reliance. Agriculture is a biological process. Not everything grows everywhere um, successfully and not everything grows everywhere cost competitively. Uh, so when we think about being reliant, we, that's not always the aim. Uh, we need to be more resilient. As you've heard from these panelists, resilience often means strengthening regional trade, shortening that supply chain, and investing in that infrastructure. And uh, rural roads are very passionately spoken about here, but it also includes things like storage which we talked, earlier, talked about earlier. And further, it includes looking at tech and digitization and a fit for purpose approach in the African context for what that tech can look like. Uh, perhaps, perhaps tech more adopted by agribusiness versus direct to the farmer, or more simple, simple things that the farmer can use. use. Uh, so that's one big takeaway I'd love to leave all of you with. Um, and now I just like to go around to our panelists um, a question for you, there was a question very early on that was posed to me, which is, what can the food system look like uh, after this? And I would just say, if you had one piece of advice on a game-changing action or investment a government or any other player could take in this context to preserve or maintain food security, what would that be? No pressure. would love to hear from you. Um, Cola, I'm actually going to start with you. In 15 seconds or less. 15 seconds or less. <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, replicate the U.S. farm credit system. You know, you go out there and underwrite a public bond for $80 billion, and overnight you will finance, uh, you'll finance 14 million farmers uh, and ensure they have access to all the knowledge and, and inputs they need to attain yields on par with the rest of the world. Thank you. Uh, Mizuo. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll advocate for substantive investment in irrigation infrastructure so that we can have, uh, you know, you know multi-cycle cropping within a year, not rain-fed, which can would go a long way to boost volumes. We have minimal in, um, irrigation across uh, many countries, and in Nigeria in particular, the irrigation network that's there uh, was built in the late 70s, early 80s. And if we're looking at reducing food security and uh, ensuring better reliability of harvests, having that irrigation infrastructure there so it's less um, weather dependent uh, to ensure harvests, I think is critical. Thank you. Linda? Um, for me, it would be to reduce the um, 
the bottlenecks around the linkages. So logistics, 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 and uh, cold chain and uh, warehousing. Wonderful. And Etsuko, last but not least. Thank you. Uh, for me, it would be promote digitalization, unleash the full efforts, capacity, energies of the private sector. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. And thank you to our panelists um, for such a great diversity of viewpoints and perspectives on this topic, um, which is, of course, of critical importance, not just during COVID-19, uh, but every day. Uh, Teresa, back to you. No, well, thank you, Jillian, Cola, Linda, Atsuko, Mezu. Thank you all for participating today. And Jillian and McKinsey, thank you very much for leading this panel, bringing the topic to us and, um, and sharing the results of your recent report on this topic. Thank you. I want to right. thank all of our media partners who have been critical in making sure that we get the word out to um, the audience and to everyone, all the new members of the audience who are joining us for the first time. So thank you to all of our media partners. Again, I'd like to thank Standard Bank for being our lead partner in this endeavor. We have three silver sponsors, FSDH Merchant Bank, who will be developing a session with in the coming set of live uh, webinars that will start on July 8th. We will be working with them. We want to thank Funke Opeke of Maine One for her steadfast support over many, many years. We want to thank TD Bank in particular, Admaster Tedese, for his contribution to this series through his intellectual capital and for TDB's contribution. And we once again thank Covington and thank Covington for bringing us Eric Holder in our session a couple of weeks ago um, on law. And so as we look forward, once again, I'd like to remind everyone that we will next week be bringing you uh, recorded sessions for the next two weeks that will be part of the Africa Investment Conference led by Standard Bank and ICBC Bank. And then we will be back with live sessions again, starting on the 8th of July with five sessions and you will receive lots of information about them. We do keep getting some questions about where can these videos be found for replay or the slides. Everything associated with this webinar series is found on virtualconferenceafrica.com. Please visit the site to replay this session or to replay any of the previous nine sessions. Uh, all of the slides presented today and throughout the series are available there as are updates as to the future exciting content that we have coming forward. So again, thank you very much to Jillian and to McKinsey for your partnership today. And we look forward to continuing our work with you on other sectors in the future. And um, until then, again, uh, to this very vast and, um, and insightful audience, we thank you for your questions, for your contributions, and for your loyalty in coming back week after week to join us. Goodbye. <laughs>